Jesus walks on water, Matthew 14, 25 to 33, from the brickbible.com. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, got into a boat and set off across the lake. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind blew and the waters grew rough. Then in the early morning hours, Jesus came towards them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him, they were terrified. Crying out in fear, they said, it's a ghost. But Jesus said to them, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, Order me to come to you, walking on the water. Jesus said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water. But he was afraid when he saw the wind. Peter began to sink and cried out, Save me, Lord! Jesus reached out his hand and grabbed him and said, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they climbed into the boat, the wind stopped. Those in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I tried walking on water and I just couldn't do it. But wouldn't it be great if we could wouldn't it be great for people like these two? The one on the left is Melita, and she's a minister in the Protestant church of Kiribati, uh, a small island nation, or as she said, it's a big ocean nation covering about 300,000 square kilometers of the Pacific. And Mina on the right is from Tuvalu, a smaller country, but both made up of very sm small islands very low lying, the, the highest point on the main island of Tuvalu is about one and a half metres above sea level. And they're the biggest islands are perhaps as much as a kilometre wide. And so you can imagine as um, in a big storm, the sea comes in quite a way over their islands. And because the sea is rising, the average sea level is rising as um, the earth warms, uh, and the sea expands as it soaks up some of that warmth, as polar ice melts and as glaciers melt in the mountain regions of the earth, that all ends up in the sea. So for people on some of these small islands, life is getting very precarious. Uh, food is getting scarce, they're having to import most of what they need, and so many people are leaving and are becoming refugees in New Zealand and other, other safer places doesn't quite seem fair does it if only if only they could walk on water well we can't walk on water but we can maybe do something about sea level rise and of course a lot of as you know and as you're already doing things to to reduce your carbon emissions and to reduce the amount of pollution you put out there um, this all makes a difference and it's good but what I've been thinking about lately is what if we focus less on doing less harm and more on doing more good. Do you see? What, I don't know if that makes much of a difference for you. What I'm thinking of, what if we uh, try and put into practice the, the call to Abraham, say, to, to be a blessing to the earth, or the call to Adam and Eve in the garden to care and tend for the garden. Um, that idea of being a blessing, or even in as Jesus' words in one of the dodgy verses at the end of Mark, where he calls on his disciples to proclaim good news to the whole creation. I mean, doing less harm is great and we need to, but actually isn't it so much better if we try to be a good thing, not a less bad thing? And to explore this a bit further, uh, I need to take you from the beach and the water to the downs. So let's go. Ta-da! That was quick. 
Welcome to this lovely grassy field on the South Downs. Chalk grassland is an enormously rich habitat. It's so biodiverse and yet so fragile that some people have referred to it as Europe's rainforest. But it's not a natural habitat. It, it's the result of thousands of years of careful management by people. And the secret is grazing. Having just the right density of sheep or cattle and grazed in the right kind of rotation keeps the grass at the right length for a variety of plants to flourish. And with a flourishing variety of flowers and plants comes a flourishing variety of insects and other invertebrates. And with a flourishing variety of invertebrates comes a flourishing variety of birds. And all that animal dung helps keep the soil in good shape as well. It seems to me that this chalk grassland is a good example of people living in harmony with nature and intervening in such a way that the end result is richer and better for nature than would be the case if the people hadn't grazed the land in the way they have done. But just like the coastlands and the islands of the world that are under threat from sea level rise, uh, this kind of habitat is under threat as well. Uh, only about 4% of the South Downs National Park is chalk grassland. A huge amount of it has been lost since the Second World War, put under the plough or turned to scrub woodland. The reasons are very complex, but for our purposes today, we come down to the way that we humans divide ourselves off from nature, either to say that we're superior and nature exists just to serve our immediate needs, or to say that we're so harmful that we should back right off and intervene as little as possible. Religiously speaking, the division carries into those kind of popular ideas that claim some kind of existential difference for humans, you know, such as humans alone have souls, or the worldview that's reflected, say, in a lot of modern worship songs that see heaven as some kind of super duper worship festival with a load of human spirits lost in wonder, love and praise while the band plays on. And that's not a biblical picture, even if you find it attractive, I'm sorry about that. Right through the Bible, old and new, the goal of salvation is not only a new heaven, but a new earth. And even the scary language of consummation that you find, say, Second Peter, is not the language of destruction, but of refining. Old Testament prophecies of the world to come often include animals, the most obvious example being Isaiah 11. But there are many examples where animals in the Bible, domestic and wild, are spoken of very positively. One of my favourites is Proverbs chapter 30, verse 25 and 26, that speak of ants and badgers as people, although most English translations can't quite stomach that. And Paul in Romans 8 says that all creation will participate in the liberation of the children of God. All creation. We are nature. We are creation. And to deny this, either by dominating it and exploiting majority nature, or by withdrawing from it, would be to deny our nature and our calling. God calls us to be good news to the whole creation. And the gospel story of Jesus and Peter walking on water hints at the danger that we're in. And maybe it's worth, at some point, spending some time in that story in your imagination and ask, what do you think would have been a good outcome for the story? What would have been a, a different outcome? Maybe better, maybe just as good. If Peter hadn't been afraid, would he and Jesus have carried on walking on the water? If the disciples hadn't been afraid of Jesus, Perhaps he'd just have got in the boat and the storm would have gone quiet and they'd all have carried on to the shore. I think it's open-ended, as are so many parables, but the danger for us, I think, with it is to focus on the miraculous and to long for that, as if triumphing over nature is a goal in itself. I think there's a little bit of the glimpse of the resurrection in this story. You know, it's Jesus kind of doesn't obey the laws of nature. But Jesus didn't rise from the dead in order to beat nature. 
you know, either to appear in a locked room or to vanish at will or to walk on water or whatever it would be. The resurrection of Jesus is about all things being made new, the renewal of the whole creation. Paul in Colossians 1 calls Jesus the firstborn from the dead. And if he's the firstborn, others will follow. As Paul makes clear in other places, uh, all things following Jesus into the new creation. And it's no good for us to focus on the miraculous as a way of avoiding the hard graft of changing how we live so that our lives are good news for the whole creation, good news in a suffering and broken world. Because you can't walk on water. It's one thing to see getting out of the boat as an allegory for stepping out of your comfort zone and taking some risks. But it's, if it's an allegory for leaving this physical world for some kind of ghostly, otherworldly existence, or for seeing this life of faith as having supernatural powers, it's dangerous. Because my friends Miner and Melita on their Pacific islands can't walk on water. Here and now, they need good news. And the miracle they need is for millions of people to change how they live. So the sea doesn't rise anymore, and, the, and they need to see the miracle of a fairer distribution of nature's abundance and the miracle of generous hospitality for the refugees for whom it's too late. And I think that verse at the dodgy end of Mark 16 is really helpful because it holds out that idea that being, of being good news to the whole creation. It brings us back to Eden and to Abraham and Jacob and Moses the call to serve creation and be a blessing that is at the foundation of our faith. It brings us back to those prophetic visions in Old and New Testaments of the renewal of all things in a new creation, of which the resurrection of Jesus is just the beginning and the model and the open door. It brings us back to our own createdness, our creatureness, our human nature, that we are nature, we are as interconnected and interdependent as anything else in these global ecosystems. So let's work on ways of, that we can be good news for creation. Let's work at reconnecting ourselves spiritually as well as physically and practically in, creation, in nature, in creation. Let's look for ways in which we can cooperate and bring our lives into more harmony with nature. Ways we can be kind and gentle, generous and loving. Find out what God's calling you to do and do it. We can't walk on water, but we can shape our lives to Jesus. We can welcome him into our boat. We can trust him and listen to him. We can be good news for all creation. <laughs>